Hi, and welcome back to Quantum Programming with Sir. I'm Amy. And I'm Catherine. In this episode, we're going to start simulating the quantum circuits we have been building in previous episodes. When setting up a simulation of a quantum circuit, we need to decide what kind of quantum system the simulator should represent and make sure the simulator we use meets our performance requirements. So in this episode, we will run our quantum circuits on simulators that mimic the behavior of perfect quantum systems. By a perfect quantum system, I mean one without the errors that arise from the noise that is present in physical quantum systems. We'll try out two simulators, and as we do so, we will have a look at simulator performance and talk about why this matters. Running your circuits on a simulator which represents a perfect quantum system is a good starting point as we investigate the behavior of our quantum circuits. It's also very similar to how we traditionally debug programs. So let's do this. You may recall that we built a quantum circuit that implements a specific instance of the bernstein vazirani algorithm in episode 2. That's right. So as always, we will start by opening Colab and quickly installing circ. I will, as before, use pip install in quiet mode and then just import circ. So I'm going to bring back the code we wrote in episode two to create our quantum circuit and make a few additions. First, let me define a function in Python that will give me this circuit with and without the reset measurements. Hang on, why are you doing that? The reason for this is that I want to create a version of this circuit made entirely of unitary operations, so without resets and measurements, and another with the realistic reset and measurements that we need in our experiments on real quantum computers. Oh, got it, got it. So I'm going to use resets equals false and measurements equals false here. And I will use resets equals true and measurements equals true here. So now if I print both circuits, we can see clearly the difference between them is in the beginning and the end of the circuit. Right, right, that's right. So now let's simulate our circuit and see what happens. We've already seen one way of doing a simulation in episode two, but we did not really get into the details there. So let me reproduce the episode two simulation code for a moment so we can discuss it. So I'll be defining the simulator to be the default circ simulator using circ.simulator. And then I will run on the simulator with sim.run. As you see, I'm using the circuit with reset and measurements here. So when I print the result, I have the result 11001, just as we saw in episode two. Abe, can you explain what happened here? Sure. Well, there are two types of circuit executions, broadly speaking. The first is where we're interested in running the circuit repeatedly and collecting statistics of the output. And we're collecting the statistics across all these runs. In CERC's language, this is called a run, and that's why we wrote sim.run. Thanks. So in the example here, I actually did not specify how many times I want to run the circuit, so CERC just did it once. However, I can add this, repetitions equals 50, and as you see, I now have 50 results for each qubit that is measured. These results can get quite cumbersome to interpret when you have many more repetitions. Shall we try to visualize that? Yes, sure. One useful way to visualize our results is to plot a histogram that shows statistics of these outputs. CERC provides you with a quick way to do this. I can simply feed the results object into histogram, And here we have a histogram. The reason we only see one bar is that our circuit only produced one output for every one of the 50 runs. Nice, this is much easier to read than the printouts themselves. Let's have a closer look at the histogram. As you can see, here are indeed 50 results on the y-axis. The x-axis is numbered from 0 to 31, and our bar is at number 25. So you may have noticed that there are 32 numbers on the x-axis, which correspond to the 32 different possible outcomes, measuring the five different qubits in a circuit. Each qubit measurement can result in zero or one. So of course we will have two to the power of five possible outcomes. Can you change those labels on the x-axis to those binary outputs? Yeah, sure. So let me first quickly write a function that converts the numbers in the range 0 to 31 to their corresponding binary numbers. I can test this function 
by quickly asking Serk to give me all the possible binary numbers for three qubits. There should be two to the power of three outcomes here, so eight of them, going from 000 to 111. As you see with get binary list, this is exactly what we get back. So now I can pass this function into Serk's state histogram plotter. I will also tell Serk to change the label on the x-axis to measurement outcome by defining x label equals measurement outcome. If you have visualized data in Python before, you've certainly run into matplotlib, and Serk works very nicely with matplotlib. Visualizing results is important when you're learning about quantum programming, and that's because it allows you to see what your circuits are doing. Catherine, how do we do this? Yes, I can just import matplotlib.pyplot and use that. So let's try to make the histogram more readable. As you see, there are five bits for each point on the x-axis, so I'll try to make the figure bigger. I'll be defining fig size to equal 25 by 3. And now I will also pass all my axes to circ state histogram plotter. We can now clearly see each label on the axis. Let's also rotate the labels by 90 degrees to make the figure even cleaner by using label rotation equals 90. One last thing, if I was only interested in the number of non-zero outputs, I could tell the result object to give me a histogram itself and then plot that. So I will first collect the non-zero outputs and then use circ.plotStateHistogram and feed in those non-zero outputs. This is very nice. It looks like in binary, the result is 11001, meaning that the five qubits were measured in exactly those numbers. That's what we expect from this specific circuit because the algorithm tells us that the ones corresponding to where the C0 gates in the circuit originate. But we also saw that the decimal result was 25. Exactly, and you can convince yourself that the two are the same by using Python to compute the decimal value of the binary 11001. As you see, this returns exactly 25. That's great. Hopefully, you've so far seen a few different ways to visualize the output of several runs from your quantum circuit. Let's go through another way to run your simulations. So first of all, to show you why it is important to think through your performance requirements, I'll do exactly what we did above again, but run the circuit 1000 times instead of 50 by setting repetitions equal to 1000. That took a while. Exactly. It took us about nine seconds to finish the 1,000 repetitions and get a result. For context, in a research experiment, we normally need to run our circuits tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of times, depending on the application and the number of variations of the circuit we need to run. As you can see, 1,000 repetitions took us nine seconds, so running 10 or 100 times more repetitions will just take ages. Besides this, the runtime for a single repetition also depends on the size of your circuit and on whether or not you are simulating a perfect quantum system. The Google Quantum AI team has open sourced a tool called QSIM, which can do very fast circuit runs. Catherine, can you tell us how QSIM does this? Sure, so QSIM is written in C++, whereas CERC's default simulator is written in Python. And QSIM also uses various clever tricks such as gate fusion. If you would like to learn more about this, you can read about how QSIM was built and see advanced examples of QSIM simulations in the white paper that's linked in the description below this video. We also have QSIM documentation on our website, uh, which is quantumai.google. You can just hover over the software tab and click on QSIM. Thanks, Catherine. Let's set up a simulation of our circuit using QSIM. Yes, 
Using QSIM with CERC is actually quite easy. We will just install the library QSIM CERC, which is our QSIM to CERC translation layer. We're using pip install in quiet mode as before, and then we're just importing QSIM CERC. So now to simulate our circuit with QSIM, we need to declare that our simulator will come from QSIM CERC. So we'll redefine our simulator sim um, by setting it equal to QSIM .QSIM simulator. And then we will run on this simulator with sim.run as before. In fact, we're using exactly the same code as we did in CERC's default simulator to do our runs. That was fast. QSIM did the 1000 repetitions almost instantly as opposed to the nine seconds that it took us to do so using CERC's default simulator. And of course, as before, I can take the result object from QSIM's runs and plot the corresponding histogram. As you see, circ.plot state histogram reproduces our previous results exactly. I really like how changing from circ's default simulator to QSIM's super fast one is only taking small changes in your code. QSIM circ really makes that connection between QSIM and circ smooth. All right, so now you've seen how you can run your quantum circuits on circ's default simulator and on QSIM. What we've been doing so far is actually called sampling. This is because with your runs, you are sampling the outputs from a distribution by running the circuit several times. Right, I've written in other quantum programming languages and sometimes I might be interested not so much in sampling the circuit, but in investigating the quantum state at various points in the circuit. How can I do this in CERC? So you can simply tell CERC to simulate the state vector by using dot simulate instead of dot run. So we are going back to CERC's default simulator here, and then instead of sim.run, we are using sim.simulate. Note that I've now started to use the circuit without resets and measurements, because I want to evolve that starting quantum states with only unitary operations. When I print the result, I can see the output quantum state for each qubit. In fact, I can do the step-by-step -step through the circuit at each moment. If you do not recall what moments are, do check out episode two because we covered them in detail there. So to do this, I can write sim.simulate moment steps and use a for loop to step through all the moments in the circuit. Very nice. I like that you can step through the moments of the circuit and extract the quantum state just after that moment. This is also very helpful for reproducing how quantum textbooks describe the operations of quantum circuits. We now see that the quantum state at each step in the circuit is printed out. If we scroll back up to look at the circuit, we see that it has six moments without the resets and measurements. And that's why we're getting six printouts here. Of course, we just did our state vector simulation using CERC's default simulator. But as before, we can swap this for the QSIM simulator. I'll show you now. So we are going back to defining our simulator as QSIM CERC .QSIM simulator, And then we are simply using sim.simulate again. Thank you. 
And here's again the output quantum state that we were expecting. Let's show one more way to investigate quantum circuits. Sometimes you might be interested in understanding the whole effect of a circuit by computing the effective unitary that it implements. I can do this in CERC by appending dot unitary. And that gives the corresponding unitary matrix that this circuit applies on any starting quantum state. Since it acts on six qubits, it is not surprising that when I add dot shape, we find that the unitary matrix has a size of two to the power of six or 64. Now, these were just a few different ways of exploring quantum circuits using our open source tools. I encourage you to explore our simulate page at quantumai.google slash circ slash simulate, and particularly the section on exact simulation, which covers the topics that we discussed in this video more extensively. Thanks, Abe. So let's take a break here. In our next episode, we will be discussing how to run quantum circuits in more realistic settings by introducing various kinds of noise into the simulation that lead to errors in computations on physical quantum computers. Bye. Bye.